but my perception is that humor is loosely based on truth and you know that we're all failed human beings and we all have things wrong with us and we're not you know what's the other quote uh, the famous one that humor is often the gap between aspiration and reality i think in whatever environment you find yourself it's very healthy to know that you're not all it and that we all make mistakes Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are going to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is an award-winning comedian known for his legendary one-liners. With his deadpan delivery, he has built a career performing puns that kill. He is a warlock of wordplay and a wizard of wild hair. His stand-up has garnered several awards, including the Perrier Best Newcomer Award, the Sony Award for Best Comedy, and the Chortle Best Headliner Award, just to name a few. When he isn't masterfully performing on the stage, you can catch him surfing the radio and television waves on shows like Thanks A Lot, Milton Jones, which ran for four series on BBC Radio 4. On TV, he's been on Live at the Apollo, Michael McIntyre's Roadshow, and is a regular on the BBC television series Mock the Week. If his legendary stand-up career has yet to catch your attention, wait until you see his favourite shirts. Milton Jones, welcome to the Humorology Podcast. Hello, Paul. How are you? I'm very well indeed, thank you. Lovely to see you here in normal attire. Mm, yes, this is me on my day off. <laughs> I, I, I've heard you say that you were quite quiet at school, which is probably why you ended up doing one-liners, so every word counted. Was the young Milton Jones already thinking about funny lines, but maybe a little bit reticent to say them out loud? Yes, I mean, it, when I go back and I meet someone from my old primary school, they say I really didn't say very much at all. But what I did say was quite often funny, even though that isn't my perception of it. What happened was later in school, um, I started doing drama and bits and pieces like that, and actually impersonations of teachers. And um, actually, a teacher thought a new boy had joined the school because I'd been there all the time, but he hadn't actually noticed me till I started doing drama, uh, which I don't know is good or bad. Uh, I suppose I'm sort of introvert by nature, really. Um, it's weird because my wife is more of an extrovert. And, you know, if we're going to a party, she'll say, oh, good, we don't know anyone there. I'll go, oh, no. <laughs> this sounds like the worst thing possible to me. So, uh, yeah, I didn't didn't say very much. But there's also that thing about uh, performance being the shy person's revenge on the world. And I think that applied to me as well. You know, I felt like I had something to say, but it was easier to do it if I put on a mask and did it. And that's sort of what I ended up doing for a living. Mind you, if you told me I was going to be doing that when I was six or seven, that would be the most scary thing I could think of in my entire life. But actually, I feel like it's almost someone else doing it. I'm possessed when I'm doing it, so it's okay. Well, was humour valued in your family? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> I saw my grandfather, my literal real grandfather, was a fruit salesman in Swansea Market. So he had the sort of get up and, you know, he'd hold two cu cucumbers together and say it was a massive great cucumber. You know, he had patter, basically. And then my other grandfather was a missionary in Germany. So he also had that kind of stand up gene of, of getting up and addressing people. And I think sometimes that is genetic. I don't know about you. Sometimes you talk to comedians and, uh, you know, it's sort of in the family getting up and 
talking. Um, I guess it's a sort of genetic thing. And uh, certainly at home, my dad was a fan of the goons and uh, we read scripts, even though we didn't know what we were talking about, just did silly voices. And all of that was very encouraged. Uh, and there was sort of a lot of laughing at home, a lot of playing tricks on each other. Uh, and fortunately, I managed to turn it into a job. <laughs> well, didn't we both? Uh... Isn't it true that, I mean, both of us and we originally met at the comedy store uh, a long time ago, the laugh is is a drug. Uh, that acceptance, that, that thrill is really quite hard to replace by anything else. Absolutely. And I think the reason I ended up doing one-liners was because I was actually quite nervous. I needed to get as many laughs as possible in as short a time as could be done. So... If that's what you're aiming at, you end up doing one-liners. And that's handy for me when I'm doing television because I get straight to the joke. Harder when I'm on tour and have to do an hour and 20 minute show, you know, because that is a lot. That's 250 one-liners. And that's a lot of writing. Uh, so it's a lot of effort to make happen. But yeah, the also if you're socially awkward, <laughs> if you can make people laugh, that fills a lot of the time so that you don't have to come up with other uh, material, as it were, that's sort of interesting, but not laugh out loud. And it's sort of, it's a kind of deflection process, you know, socially, you're kind of going, no, look over there, there's a lion or whatever, just to stop people looking at you. Even if I go to a party or something, I talk, talk for an hour or two, but then I need to go to the bottom of the garden and just recollect my thoughts for 10 minutes and then come back in again, because it's too intense. So this whole, uh, making people laughing is a, is a way of going, no, back to you, back to you all the time. So so it's essentially a shield, is it? That, that, that humour is the shield that, that actually then people can't get inside that or what's happening? Yeah, I don't think it's black and white. As we know, there are almost two types of comic. There's the one who's the same all the time. Gag, 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 on stage, oh. off stage. They're on all the time. And then there's the more schizophrenic, which I like to think I am, that is one person off stage and one person on stage. And the moment, you know, people see me putting my hair up and with the shirt on, that's, that's when the mask comes on. And I go out and I do, but, but the moment I step off, it's, um, well, is there some milk to pick up on the way home? Or, you know, it's, it's go straight back to mundane things. So, uh, that's the one I am. Um, but, you know, the, those people who are on all the time are very funny to be with, um, although you probably don't want to share a car journey with them for too long. Exhausting is the word, isn't it, really? Uh, they, I, I know because we've talked over the years that you feel it's crucial to create an atmosphere for comedy to work. You know, it's not just about the lines. You have to create the atmosphere. In the real world, and our listeners are generally in the real world where people have real jobs, do you think it's possible to create an atmosphere where humour can thrive? Is that something that you can take from the stage and transfer into other worlds? Well, in a way, it's difficult for me to answer because I've never had a proper job. <laughs> so <laughs> I haven't been in those environments very much. But my perception is that humour is loosely based on truth and, you know, that we're all failed human beings and we all have things wrong with us and we're not, you know, what's the other quote, uh, the famous one, that humour is often the gap between aspiration and reality. And I think in whatever environment you find yourself, it's very healthy to know that you're not all it and that we all make mistakes. And one thing I have seen in other environments is sometimes a speaker will get up and make a mistake and not mention it and try and get away with it. And we know if a comic does that, he lose the trust of the crowd. And it's very important to just have a realistic view of yourself and what you're doing so that um, people trust you. 
and no company is perfect. No group of people have it all together, have, have learnt everything, because they would be far more successful for a start if they were. Um, so humour, I think, used properly, fills in that gap between hope and actual reality. Um, and, th and that's very valuable. Having said that, I, I was thinking about this, what I was going to say today, and also humour sort of needs defining in the sense that, you know, Adolf Hitler probably had a sense of humour, he thought, but I suspect it was rather based on bullying and picking on people. So humour per se is not necessarily a great thing, you know, in its broadest definition. I would argue that uh, truth is a good thing. And if you, you know, when you go and see stand up comedy, what you're seeing is a stylized version of people telling you the truth, hugely exaggerated. And I remember one of the first things I ever saw was um, going to comedy clubs. I saw Eddie Izzard um, do a routine about the missiles in the first Iraq war. You know, that they were telling us that these missiles were, were so technical, they could, they were precision things and they were only killing bad people. And Eddie did this great routine about, oh, the, the missiles are brilliant. They, they go to the house, they read who's in, they ring the doorbell, they go upstairs, they check, you know, and he sort of nailed the whole thing in a little routine. It was satirical about the government and their lies. And I just thought, ah, that's what I want to do. Not, I mean, I'm not political and, and you know, I don't do that kind of stuff, but just the idea of, yes, that's what we're all thinking and we can't quite nail it, but you've nailed it and now we're all together, having agreed that this is a, a bad thing, but we've all noticed it. And if you can make people resonate with what you're saying, um, I think that's a very healthy thing to do. I completely agree. And I, I, I think it's it's one stage on from the court jester, isn't it? It's truth to power. Uh, uh, essentially, which is a very, very val valuable thing because you, you suddenly get perspective on life. And without that perspective, we're lost, aren't we? Yeah, and absolutely. And also you realise you're not alone in thinking what you're thinking. And uh, I mean, there are lots of different angles on comedy. You know, surprise is another thing. You know, if you, if you can keep on surprising which is probably something I rely on more, where you set up a world and you say one thing, um, you know, you say, I spent the morning attaching a lock to the front of my house to slow down burglars who arrived by barge. <laughs> you put a little cartoon in people's heads uh, that you pull the rug on when you get to the punchline. And uh, that... I think part of it, Paul, is that <laughs> as English people or Anglo-Saxons or whatever we are, we're not very good at expressing emotion. So that as we go through our lives, lots of tension builds up gradually. And it's all tiny. It's a death by a thousand cuts. You know, it's little things that we don't, you know, I think it's, and then we get to a, a professional space where someone's making jokes and we suddenly have all this tension come out of us in terms of laughter at stuff. And it would also explain why Italians and French people don't have the comedy circuit So in the same way. I mean, they have clown, clowns and stuff, but I think they're much better at getting their emotions out in the first place. Whereas Brits tend to be quite uptight and slightly passive aggressive. So they need an excuse to let out their emotions and we are we are the sort of prostitutes that go there and help them you know to get all their, their tension out yeah uh, that uh, it's comedy hand relief basically <laughs> there's another name for a show yes <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes i mean but that that's uh, the the resistance to actually doing everything is probably what c creates the need for it mm. Yeah. And we've all walked out in hundreds of audience and felt the tension in the room, the expectancy. Please help me. <laughs> we want we're here to to get something off our chest. But please tell us what it is or part of what it is or give us an excuse to, to let go. 
And the other part of that is uh, the, the, the confidence to do it because part of the audience are looking at you. And this is for anybody who ever has to get up and make a speech is looking at you. And one of the, the, the things you can see writ large on their faces is please don't be shit. <laughs> yes. Well, quite. And no, you must. I one of the ways I found of not looking nervous was to look really, really nervous. Uh, just to look, to, to adopt a look of semi-terror. And that sort of became funny, you know, yeah. that, that clearly I was acting, but it, it was a, a mask that helped me mask my own nerves. And eventually I lost that because you just get used to standing up and in the end your body can't take it anymore in terms of the nerves and you just go, oh, I'll just do this. And uh, yes, that that's the other thing. You, you don't want to apologize for what you're doing in any way, physically or verbally. You're doing what you're doing. And the, the best MCs, you know, the person who goes on first, look like they don't care. Yeah. They go on and uh, whether it's Alan Davis or, um, I don't know, Bob Mills years ago. Um, yeah, yeah uh, Tim Smith. Yeah, Tim Clark, what, whoever it is, it's like they're, I'm here. I'm going to have a good, good time. Are you going to join me? You know, not yeah. please, please like our show. Don't do that. Uh, no, they must have faith. The audience, it's like a, a religious meeting almost. They must have faith straight away, but they, they must go in totally committed in order to get the trust of the audience. But your job is, and this is something that our audience can take away, your job is to look like you've got this covered. And it's funny that you mentioned Alan Davis, who we both know well. Um, but Alan used to play with that concept, if you remember, in the early days and would go on and stumble about and look like he was just sort of... Uh, and then he, you could feel the tension rise in the audience as they were going, oh, no, he is shit. And then he would break that moment with that level of surprise and go to the mic and go, don't go thinking I'm shit. I'm just doing what you do at work. You don't autom you know, you don't automatically sit down and start working straight away, do you? I'm I'm essentially in the toilet reading the Daily Mirror and having a shit. He would subtly then go on to talk about the beer he was drinking. And he would have material on that. Yes. And that would be five minutes of his act. But it it went so smoothly from I don't know what don't think I don't know what I'm doing, and then you didn't notice the gear change, but yeah, now, seamless. You, yeah, yeah. And that's what the best people do, but they only do that because of practice. Well, they've got to have an initial, isn't the cliche. And I've said this many times, um, and I've forgotten who said it originally is that doing stand up, and that you can probably apply that to speaking in front of people is learning a musical instrument, except you do all your practice in public. And a lot of people will either give up doing stand up, as we know, or, and I think Eddie would say this of himself, that to begin with, he wasn't 100% brilliant, but he kept going, kept going, kept going, and had that marathon mentality that he has of just, this is what I'm doing, and I'm going to keep total commitment. That's what it takes, isn't it? It's, uh, it's like sport. If you're going to hit a tennis ball or do a rugby tackle, it's far more likely to come off if you give 100% rather than go tentatively, oh, I hope this works. It won't if you do that. And the same is true of public speaking. You've got to go, bam, this is me, this is what I'm doing. And and when things go wrong, which you touched upon as, as well, be uh, confident enough, and that's the word, to go, well, I really screwed that up. I mean... Yeah, yeah. And the worst thing you can do is pretend. <laughs> that you haven't made a, made a mistake. Alan Davis as well, I remember him saying that he, I don't know why we talk about Alan Davis all the time, but um, that it was a big jump in his career when he took the mic out of the stand because he had been sort of hiding behind it. You know, it was there and yeah. maybe t two hands on the mic even or, uh, but as soon as he went, right, this is happening, it gave him the sort of performance and the it was like a visual symbol of, right, now I'm coming at you. 
and I have the confidence to do that. So listen to what I've got to say. But I, I think that's a great thing because that also plays into the whole body language thing of you, you are freed. And uh, yeah, and if you just look at the statistics from a psychological perspective of who gets attacked, it's on public transport, say, it's generally people who make themselves smaller, who actually go, oh, don't notice me, don't notice me. Whereas if statistically, if you don't want to be attacked, you make yourself bigger. And it's, I'm sure this is just a biological imperative, but people are less likely to go. And it's the same on stage. You know, well, I was going to say we've all seen open spots who who just freeze or get, you know, brain freeze, and uh, there comes a point at which they're never going to get it back, and you need to put off that moment as much as possible, and if you can, laugh at yourself. You know, I mean, like you say, a make made a mistake, or even something like. Oh, this is going well or you know just something that acknowledges you have an idea of how it looks like um, yes. even if it even if it's not complimentary to yourself that will give you another minute and hopefully you can get something over that you know um, I've got a thing because I'm on tour at the moment and the shows you know an hour and a quarter or whatever it is and um, occasionally I make a slip with the words and I say stop right I made a mistake I'm going to go back to where it all went wrong and then I say good evening it's nice to be here <laughs> <laughs> and just go right back to the beginning again and that sort of you can feel the room go what he's made a oh it's all right he knows what he's doing you know okay. yeah so if you could find a way like that of owning up but you know, mo when you see um, a comedian dealing with hecklers, now sometimes the impro can be great, but often when a heckler is blown away by a comedian, it's because that comedian had that heckle before and didn't know how to handle it. So he went home on the bus and he worked out exactly what he was going to say next time. And people tend to shout the same stuff, usually. And when that stuff came back two weeks later, he was ready and it looked like magic to everyone. But it's only because he did the work. And you can sort of do that, I guess, in speaking and think, well, what could go wrong? Yeah. The computer might freeze, the, um, the caretaker might walk in, uh, my notes might go everywhere. What am I going to say at those points? Uh, and for me, that's what I would do. I'd, I'd try and work it out. I may think of something spontaneous in the moment, but I'm far more likely to do that if I've already got some bullets in my gun ready to go for things that go wrong, because you'll be part of the show. Exactly. And that's uh, one of the many reasons why I advise everybody to go and, and catch your new tour, because you will not only laugh and, until you are, are, are hurting, you will also learn a lot about stagecraft and, and about how to manage these situations. I'm really interested about your tours, because when I've seen you, you get a multi-aged audience. And I think you describe it as something similar to a pantomime crowd. Um, how does somebody in other worlds appeal in businesses, a, appeal across ages? Um, some of our listeners were having work situations where there's a great age range. So what is the key to actually being able to connect across the ages? Well, I mean, clearly it would depend what the business was about and, and you know, how it was yeah. sold, sold. But... Um, I try not to talk about things that most people don't know about. Do you know what I mean? It, yeah, the, inf yeah. the information or the way you speak mustn't use words that people, that 20% of the people don't get. It's got to be as clear as possible. I mean, it sounds horrible. I did, I did a cruise once. Um, that I hated. It was like doing a council estate on sea, and it was, it was just. Anyway, they had little talks uh, that were put on by 
speakers and you know clearly the, the people weren't in the audience the, the punters on the boat weren't used to being in audiences but I, I watched the speakers and whether they were talking about ancient Greek gods or what you know some really obscure lecture they asked a question about every 30 seconds to which how many people here have got have you seen a picture of this or how many people and you've got pans just shooting up all the time or people saying yeah yeah or what so engaging is what i'm saying if you find ways for people to engage and it doesn't necessarily have to be funny it just means that they wake up and they think they're not watching telly <laughs> and that's really important to, to do that so i mean i you know when i'm doing one-liners bang 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 Sometimes after a while, you can feel them just fading away. You can feel them beginning to watch instead of laugh. So at that point, I need to have a question. Now, it might be a question that I've pre-thought the answer to, or it might be, where did you get your trousers? You know, it could be really stupid. And in a way, the more random, the better yeah. from, from my point of view, because um, it's more likely to be funny. But to, to constantly not give them the chance to glaze over. We've both done corporate events where the boss gets to speak first. And sometimes they don't listen. The audience don't listen. They're too busy filling their glasses or, and you think, hang on a minute, this company isn't going far <laughs> if no one's listening to the boss. And, you know, and I remember once someone who'd been there 40 years was getting a, a plaque or something and no one was listening and i say this is terrible you need to at least have people's engagement otherwise there's no faith in the, in the leadership i guess and the leadership in the room at the very least and you you need not to put fear in people but just enough to make them think I need to pay attention, otherwise I could be picked on. <laughs> and that's, you know, because actually there could be, and if you go too heavy handed, you could read the room wrong and they could turn against you because you've been cruel to somebody. So it's actually, you just said some very important words with with a smile on your face, because I will always do that, you know. And, and if they, you know, and you can do the school thing of, is, is that something you'd like to share with the class? And, and psychologically, as soon as you say the word class to every, anyone, they will actually revert to childhood. So they'll start to behave in a different way. But it, it's, it's the commanding of the room. And that's why, you know, um, I think you do that so brilliantly. Was that aided by, um, I know you studied drama, drama school, was that aided by that or was that learnt from years and years of stand up? I think it's more the latter. I think um, you've been in so many rooms with so many audiences that instinctively you begin to work out what you need to do here because you suffered before when it went wrong. And so instinctively, you know, if the audience are very rowdy, you need to be very still. Yeah. And if the audience are very still and quiet, you need to get into them and to be active and full of adrenaline. So if the audience are very up, you know, in Glasgow on a Saturday night, when I go on stage, I stand still for ages yeah. and just wait for them to come to me almost until the laughter and the shouting has completely died down. <laughs> and then I can do my thing Yeah, because they need to get rid of that. And if I sort of engage with them at that level, if I'm on for an hour and a half, they're not going to last. They're going to get tired and they need to just we need to it's like friday afternoon in school fingers on lips stand behind your desks we got, we've got some stuff to do so just be quiet and let's all let's all get through it and uh, but i think that comes as you say from having done it again and again and there's something inside you that tells you that that that's what's necessary because you've made the mistake of doing the other thing yeah so it becomes natural it's it's instinctual but it's it becomes 
your norm where, whereby you just do it every time and everything talk about instinctive you i think we've i've heard you say that the comedy is only given to the few that it, it, it's an instinctive thing the timing thing i i'm interested obviously the humorology project is all around is it just given to the few can anybody learn it and and what's your your thoughts on that well in a way i think it's a bit like music or drawing or something in that some people are clearly geniuses um but most people can dabble and uh you know also probably important to make the distinction between making people laugh and being laughed at <laughs> It's not quite the same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, people can make people laugh for the wrong reasons as well as, you know, perhaps they're not so self-aware or, or what it is. Um, but it, it's like you can turn into a professional musician if you put in the practice. After you've been in a thousand rooms, you can begin to smell the atmosphere and which way it could go. And there's no way around that, really. Yeah, I, I I think that's really true. And I, I think that the whole, that's the instinctive bit though, isn't it? About, you know, the sledgehammer to crack a nut. But I suspect we've all done it at times on the way up learning that and go, oh, I don't think, I mean, I once did it at a vets conference, which I was hosting many, many, many years ago. And I went in and had a go at the CEO really early on probably just a little bit too hard and he didn't have much of a sense of humor about himself and everybody just l looked to him to see if he was laughing and he wasn't and for the rest of the night i was just trying to claw it back you know it, and and that's the the first impressions thing that it's very hard to turn that barge around once you've made that first impression so i always say to people concentrate on your first impression so I think that's one of the things that you do so brilliantly is you go for the the look that sort of people go is he a little bit crazy is a little, but at least they're they're watching and going oh my god what's going to happen there's there's I presume that's just years of learning to buy yourself a little bit of wriggle room in the first impressions yes and also slightly because what i feel i do comes from left field it helps to give a big signpost towards the left field in the way i look you know with big hair and um big shirt um at the moment you know after covid and stuff i'm going on stage and saying you know big hair and what's in going nice to be back to normal isn't it <laughs> <laughs> And that, that sort of works well, because um, I think often it's interesting to opening lines are quite important in that I've heard someone say that you want to kind of encapsulate what you're going to do in the next 20 minutes in your first paragraph. Ah. You know, in your first joke, my first joke is really important because it says this is where I'm going to be coming from. OK, you know, it's where it's a silly picture, image thing. Um, what am I saying at the moment? I think it's, um, this isn't the tour, but like I did a gig the other day and I said, oh, it's great to be back to normal. I saw sheep pole dancing the other day in a kebab shop. <laughs> and that works well. It's, it's like short, short stuff, image, bang, out. That's what's good yeah. for me. So I don't know, it depends, you know, what you're talking to the people about, but um, you want to sort of set up a mini entree or a, a starter for your meal that you're about to go, and this is what it's going to be like. Well, it's the, it's the other analogy. It's a, a headline in a newspaper. This is where you, and it's sort of like the hook, and, oh, I want to hear more about that. It's, it's a tease, in a sense, but it's a defined tease. I don't know if that is such a thing. There is now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Milton, what makes you laugh? Uh, well, I mean, as you know, one of the 
the problems with doing it professionally is that it is sort of harder to make people laugh. And, you know, even if something is brilliant, the comics will be standing at the back going, oh, yes, yeah, I see that's happened. So we tend to laugh at things that go wrong. I mean, you know, our friends on stage um, trying something new that doesn't work. And you'll hear two laughs at the back going, ha, ha, like that. And they'll be the comedians off the stage. You know, there. Well, it's uh, it's funny you talk about the, the stuff going wrong because uh, uh, the, the the old Calypso twins days, we uh, we obviously got people out of the audience and there was a lot of audience participation. But the best laughs we ever got were from Kim Kinney and Stan in the sound booth. And you you'd do something and it would go to shit and everything. And you just do a look and and. and and, and, and still some of my favourite laughs. Yes. And occasionally a comic will put in a line just for other comics that the audience has no idea what they're on about. You know, there's that old heckle put down. When someone heckles you, you say, sorry, and then they repeat it. And then you say, no, I'm just sorry. You know that. <laughs> yeah. Noel James, I really like Noel James. He, just for the comics, someone heckled him and he said, pardon? And it repeated, and he said, "No, I'm just pardon." <laughs> it's like the audience totally baffled. But <laughs> oh, that is brilliant! Yeah, mm, yeah. Oh god, I've not, I've not heard that one. What are, What do you like with heckles? Because I've seen you be brilliant with hecklers. Because I think you really listen to them. Well, I think the best thing with hecklers in a comedy environment is to try and use their own weight against them. It's a sensey thing, is it? It's sort of... If I can, I like to try and win them over. And just... Because what happens is that a heckler has been thinking for two or three minutes, what shall I shout? What shall I shout? And then they shout it. But then if you engage them in conversation, they've no idea what to say. <laughs> so they're, they're probably likely to, you know, make a fool of themselves. Uh, but, you know, I just... If they're angry or something, I want to know what kind of day they've had or... Um, you know, we're, we're and obviously we've all got bullets in our gun that we can shoot if absolutely necessary. But I always think it's more interesting to to try and get something else um, that is clearly spontaneous. That's where you look like, well, you have a superpower at that point. Do you, do you think comedy is a superpower in and of itself? Like any kind of art, there are some times where you see someone who's so on form so on the edge of their own talent and taking such a big risk, you sort of take your metaphorical hat off. And there are only certain people who are sort of at that level and they're not at it all the time, really not. Um, so the answer is it can be, it can be. And some people are better at it than others. And usually I think what's interesting, I think with stand up performers, is they get very good at what they're good at, but they tend to neglect what they're weak at. Uh, so in terms of being a muscle man, they have an enormous muscle here, but the other arm is, you know, which is quite interesting if you're ever in a show and you have a director and they say, why don't you try doing it the other way? And you go, what? Okay. And it's, it's quite, makes you quite nervous to begin with, but it, it's just because we often take the least line of resistance and just go, this works. I'm sticking with that. But I mean, maybe that's a thing that can be applied to business as well, is being prepared to take criticism, not from everyone, but from people who know what they're talking about. I, I, you are, uh, and you know, you do a tour every two years. You're on tour at the moment and everything. You're one of the hardest working people in the business. Now you go, well, maybe I have to, but it, I think what people forget is that everything that looks easy is, involves a lot of work. There was a, about 10, 15 years ago, I was, um, I, was, I was working, but I wasn't really working at the level I wanted to be. And the thing about doing one-liners is it's, you don't have to talk to people, you can just shoot them out. And someone said to me, you need to be more interactive. And so I went and emceed some clubs, tiny clubs, which was really painful to do for me because I'm not a sort of blokey, your mate sort of a performer that is kind of necessary. And 
um, I, I was fortunate um, that some people let me do it in small clubs, but I actually became a bit looser as a result. And sometimes, you know, whatever you do, if you can put yourself in that place of where it's difficult, because, you know, if you're at a certain level in your career, you can coast. Um, but if you're prepared to put in a bit of extra work and suffer the pain of some failure, frankly, then you can get stronger and better and more well-rounded. Well, and it's, it's uh, you know, the psychological imperative of coming out of your comfort zone, isn't it? I mean, and all of us are, you know, naturally, well, I'm good at that, I get away with that, so I'll continue to do that. But as soon as you s step out, you learn something. It's about learning, isn't it? And you, you, you go... But I would also add another word in there. You're brave. Because, you know, I mean, you know, if I had a pound for every time that somebody has said to you, you're so brave for doing that. But you are genuinely brave because you are trying new things. Because you could doing something that you don't know. That's where the true learning is, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And in a way the more successful you are, the harder it is to take that risk because you yeah. don't want to look a fool or, you know, people have come to see you maybe <laughs> and uh, could go wrong. Um, but so it gets harder. And also as you get older, you go, oh, I can't be bothered with this, this pain business. I've, I've done that, been there, done that. But actually, yeah. if, you, if you want to, uh, we all know comics as well who are a bit dead behind the eyes because they stopped learning or they stopped taking risks and it and sadly it is possible to to have a, a well-honed act yeah. that actually isn't you know it's going to work but there isn't the sharpness there because it's worked exactly like that for the last hundred times and so i i always go out with three new jokes now, sometimes the room is in such a mess, I'm not going to try them because I won't even know if they work, to be honest. But I always have three things in my back pocket, mentally, that I will try if it's nice enough. And sometimes it's just the process of getting those ready that is good for me. Yeah. But then, as you will also know, a new bit that works well first time is one of the biggest buzzes. You know, you do a new bit and you go, woof. You go, I've got a new bit. <laughs> and th th I can use that for however many years or whatever, you know, whatever it is. And, the, um, and maybe it's a topical joke or something like that that no one else has quite nailed yet. Or, um, And you, it just gives you, you look forward then to doing that bit in your act because it's the new bit. Well, and, and I think also that, something that people can take away is the discipline because i love the idea that you're you're going i always develop three new gags for each gig now that's an extraordinary di discipline but if you're doing a load of uh, gigs you've built that in it's a machine at that point and you've built that in and here are my parameters this is what i've got to uh, do i have to do that and i found obviously you know spending a lot of my life around very successful people they're the people who challenge themselves and go i'm going to write a new book and then tell 20 people until they they feel duty bound to do it i and i think you're one of those people who constantly pushes themselves you know and i think everybody needs to understand that that's where success lies isn't it well i think so and also satisfaction you know in terms of even if you're at a certain level, you become bored. And um, we all know people who are successful who go on about the gig they didn't get rather than the gig that they did get. Yeah. And it's developing a positive mentality. I mean, a glass half full mentality, I guess, but just not being stagnant. You can get stagnant. And it, there's something good about the goalposts moving because it, yeah. it pushes you further and you know you can take some satisfaction but 
no, it's the next thing, you know, that, that was fine for tonight, but I've got a gig tomorrow night as well. So what, what am I going to be doing with that? And I, I, I have come off stage sometimes um, where I didn't try one of the three gags and I could have. And I, I just, then I sort of hate the gig. Yep. Because I, I didn't stretch myself. Well, it, it, it's funny, I, uh, and this may be a commonality, but I think successful people are always re regret what they didn't do. And it's, it's uh, you know, to use a teenage analogy, you regret not asking that girl out because your bottle went or something and everything. And I still remember those situations uh, from teenage years of you know that one girl i didn't ask out and i still it still plays on my mind so it's it's do something allow it to go wrong if it must but that will teach you something and move you forward on another level no absolutely absolutely and i think the more you do that the thicker your skin gets to potential failure as well you know the more girls you ask <laughs> the more able you are to cope with the rejection of most of them and hopefully the acceptance of one or two at least but you know you're a moving target you're a moving vehicle that is is going on and enjoying the success you have but not me mentally just shedding the failure yeah and you're on the way to somewhere you've got an, uh, you've got an, a destination isn't it? it you've got an outcome and this is just part of the process to get to that whereas if you stagnate you go i really want to be over there but you're not actually moving towards wherever over there we've got deeply philosophical on the humorology podcast today haven't we that's fantastic it's wonderful if i asked you to make a business case for humour, what would you include in it? The few co the companies I come across are actually me doing corporates, but but it's also interesting in that I think it probably is a good thing because I go in and smell the atmosphere straight away, yeah. and sometimes it's a bad atmosphere, and by that I mean an atmosphere of fear, where people are, for want of better expression, trying to use each other to further their own agenda there are others where they're far more team led and people like each other and people have been there a long time i mean that's often one of the things that people loyalty can be bought by atmosphere you want to like the place and the people you're with and the best way of doing that is by having the leadership being the sort of people you want to be around and help. I think the whole thing comes down to being human, actually, as I think about it. Treating each other as human beings and having a laugh with each other rather than at each other means that people will stay with you longer. There are some people who are principally money driven. But once you get to a certain level, I'd much rather have a nice time. Once I've covered the bills, I'd much rather have a nice time. Yeah. And if you can create that atmosphere with joy and um, relaxing together, quite often people say to me when I go into a company, we work hard and we play hard. I'm not quite sure if that's true. But, you know. Um, I mean, I did, I did one not so long ago for, was it Goodyear or something? And the MC started off with the phrase, it's an exciting time to be involved with tyres. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, surely not. There's never an exciting time. But actually, actually, there were people there who'd worked there 40 years and loved it. There was clearly a community there. And it didn't matter that it was tyres. Tyres wasn't the point. <laughs> I mean, yes, it was in that it gave them a, an income. But it was more about the community and the, I suppose, love is a strong word, but it was the affinity that they had for each other. And, yeah. you know, they, they actually cared about, yes, the, how well they did their job. But that was far more likely because of the loyalty that the company had given them. No, I, I think that's that's 
so apt and so beautifully put and that's is kind of the the return on investment is that and i loved your that loyalty can be bought by atmosphere that's a just a that's going to be in the book yeah, yeah no seriously um well we've reached the part of the show milton which we like to call quick fire questions oh quick fire questions <laughs> Who is the funniest business person that you've met? Well, I mean, I have to go back to my granddad, I'm afraid. I mean, business is, <laughs> green grocer isn't perhaps the biggest, um, but he was just a raconteur and I'm not a raconteur and I could sit for hours listening to the same stories. Uh, he was really good. I mean, I can, I've met a lot of quite dull business people unfortunately and they usually come up to you in it sorry this isn't very quick fire but no, okay. um, <laughs> they quite often come up to you and say uh, when you're on stage can you do, do a joke about dave's shoes and you go uh, and you, when, once you research it, you find out that only three people know about dave's shoes and there are the audience of a thousand and it's just a, a lack of thinking it through how that would work I always found Kim Kinney very funny in a very sardonic, um, Glaswegian way. He, he would manage to prick everybody's bubble in, in, in that. Uh, but, but it was very well intentioned, I always found. Yeah, he always used to say to me, I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. And <laughs> he, he, was, uh, he was right in what he was saying because I was doing lots of different styles of joke saying just hone it down to one angle. What book makes you laugh? Well, if, if I went into gag mode, I'd go, Tales of the Unexpected, Once Upon a... <laughs> like that. <laughs> um, as I... Uh... Stay in gag mode. Yeah, OK, yeah. Uh, what else have we got? Um, uh, the other day, I read the autobiography of Francesco Sello, the man who invented sellotape. Well, I couldn't find the beginning. Um, the Forbidden Planet. Can I have a planet, please? No. I can go on, but <laughs> oh, please do. Uh, all right, so, um, hopefully I've got a book coming out soon. Uh, shouldn't have eaten it, really. <laughs> I'd like to see a world without plagiarism. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. <laughs> um... <laughs> I love that. I love that. God, what a gift for our audience. What film makes you laugh, Milton? Originally, Airplane was um well, you know that that sort of blew my mind in terms of a different angle you know and also with leslie nielsen just doing it so deadpan so well but as you can sort of tell i've i mean i haven't copied him but that is my you know deadpan nonsense that was right up my street i mean in gag terms um i didn't think much of the film coming back from australia on the plane um turned out to be a 24-hour animation of a plane travelling from Sydney to London. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you do, don't go and see Time to Destination. Mm. Oh. I, saw, I saw the French film and the other day. I mean, I think it was released here as E.T., I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. I'm sorry. Uh, for the first time in the Humorology podcast, the host cries with laughter. Uh, uh, brilliant. In a good, in a very, very good way. Um, all right, let's take a shift to the other side and go the other way and, and say, what's not funny? It's the old adage, isn't it? The um, comedy is tragedy plus time. So I guess if you've just had a tragedy, I mean, I say that, but I've, you know, how many times have we laughed at a funeral uh, or, you know, plenty of stuff. But if you're, if you're literally in the middle of an accident or a horrible thing, or I guess if you're conscious that maybe one person in the room has just gone through something difficult, it's going, ah, um, but you see, it's not a black and white thing. Cause I used to do a joke. Let me see if I can remember it. Um, I've started advertising holidays for children with short attention spans. 
but I've made the mistake of advertising them as concentration camps. And um, <laughs> right, as, as a joke, it works. But yeah. I've got too many Jewish friends who just went, yeah. And uh, and some of them were fine with it, to be fair, but others were quite upset, you know, who'd lost relatives and, got, you know, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I just stopped doing it. I just thought for the, the, the few people in the room for that is a real thing, you know, and obviously it wasn't about Jewish people or anything. Um, it was just about the word concentration. I was got another gag that I I used to use that was... Um, be careful if you're in a mosque and everyone's praying and you really enjoy leapfrog. <laughs> and, uh, right. Works. It works as a gag. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of Muslims like it. But then I did a club. It must have been in Essex somewhere. And I said it and they all went, yeah, uh, you tell them. I just thought, oh, that's, that's not the reaction I was looking for. You haven't really picked up on where I'm coming from with this. And sometimes you just, you've just got to smell the wind a bit and think they might take this the wrong way. Yeah, but I think that's a testament to who you are. You're, you are a, a nice person and a humanist and, and you know, I don't, actually it's not the right word. You're a, 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 a person who cares about people. And so, therefore, if you're going to upset anybody, you're going to take it out, aren't you? Mm. Yeah. Now, and I, I can see that there are grounds for comedy upsetting people. You know, absolutely. If it's punching up, you know, if, you know, if it's having a go at authority or some, some bad attitude, you know, I can see someone doing, you know, jokes about that. But when it's punching down... It's when it's punching sideways that it gets complicated because there's bound to be someone in the world whose dad crashed his car when a chicken crossed the road. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so any joke is going to offend someone. But sometimes, sometimes the, the, the room, you've got to read the room and think, is this going to get the right kind of reaction? Um, and en enough people going to understand really what I mean. Well, and it's intention, isn't it? It's a, it, it, it's an intention. And the, the, uh, those gags, I know you, I know who you are, you're a humanitarian. The intention is all right in those, in those gags. It's coming from the right place. And uh, I get it when suddenly you're getting people shouting because, yeah, that's telling them where it's not, the gag's not coming from that place at all. No, very, very interesting. Um, what sound makes you laugh? Uh, it's quite hard to not laugh at breaking wind, isn't it? It's just, I mean, I know it's basic. I know it's, it's basic, crazy. but it's... Yeah, it's, it's just, and the more inappropriate, the better. In terms of words, I think the word bap, just bap, it's just, doesn't matter how you say it. Do you want a bap? It's, it's just a funny word. It just makes a funny sound. Yeah. It's a combination of the word and the sound, isn't it? We're, we're, and as we know in comedy, that's sometimes... Yeah, yeah. To, well, they say, isn't it, that, that um, hard sounds are funnier. Yeah. Well, it's, the, it's, it's the Neil Simon school of uh, K's are funny from the Sunshine Boys, I think it was. K's are always funny. And it's why pickle is funny. Um, there, there you go. Um would you rather be considered clever or funny? Oh, funny every time. Clever sounds exclusive. And maybe they're saying that I think I'm clever as opposed to, I mean, mind you, I think I'm funny is, is not necessarily good either. But um, no, I think you're more accessible to people if you're funny. And children. Actually, some of the best audiences are children. You know, and they're less likely Why? to un because they have no inhibitions. They're not thinking, should I be laughing at that? Ah, no filter. And finally, Milton, 
Desert Island Gags. Now, I suspect this one with you is going to be quite tricky. You can only take one joke with you to a desert island. What would it be? Yeah, the question is, is whether it's mine or whether I drive myself mad. I mean, for, for Sean Locke's sake, I, I love his one. Um, for Christmas, my family bought me psychiatry vouchers, which is a shame because I, I wanted a crossbow. Um, <laughs> Oh, well, I, yeah, no, the, the, uh, um, I love Harry Hill's um, heckle put down, you know, when you, you think he's going to lose it at some dreadful heckler. And he said, you heckle me now, but when I get home, I've got a lovely chicken in the oven. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's sort of, I, I love those jokes that aren't formulaic. You know, you just go, where's this going? What? Oh, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And what a perfect way to end. Um, Milton, thank you so much. You'll always have my undying loyalty um, uh, because you brought the most brilliant atmosphere. Thank you so much indeed. Lovely to be with you, Paul. Thank you. The Humorology podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes, and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production. <laughs>